This is a podcast for overthinkers, overdoers, and overachievers who are tired of feeling overanxious and just want to feel better. I'm your host, certified life coach, Jackie DeCranis. Well, this is fun. So I started recording this episode about an hour ago. And somebody outside is using a hedge trimmer or a weed whacker or something. (laughs) And so the recording got interrupted by that. And then I started recording again, and then somebody was using some kind of power washer compressor. So I had to wait again. And then I recorded the whole episode and it was terrific. And then I played it back and apparently I had hit a button and it had stopped recording. So (laughs) I'd like to say third time's a charm, but it's actually the fourth time. So anyway, here we are. Welcome back. It's been a while. I have been doing, as my regular listeners know, a series of interviews of experts in everything from marriage to self-love to decision-making, and it's been super fun. But today I'm flying solo. There's no interview. It's just me. And I want to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is mindset. And more specifically, how our mindset is affected by what we say and what we think. And by no means is this a new subject for the podcast. We've talked about many versions of mindset and how our daily habits affect our mindset, what we think, what we feel affects our mindset. But I realized, and there's the word that I'm going to talk about in a minute. The reason I want to talk about this today is because I've noticed a pattern lately, and I noticed a pattern even within myself. And when I say pattern, I actually mean habit. And when I say habit, I actually mean bad habit. So when I offer this insight or observation, it's not coming from a place of judgment. It's actually coming from a place of compassion and actually self-compassion. So while I'm recording this for hopefully the listener's benefit, it's actually a reminder for me too. Because here's the thing, for all of us who do work in self-improvement, self-awareness, mindfulness, growth, expansion, whatever you want to call it, it's easy to fall back into old habits. In other words, as we grow, we adopt new and better systems and strategies, but it's like two steps forward, one step back. Because self-improvement is a practice. It's not a there, there. It's a journey. And sometimes there's a sneaky saboteur in all of us. So here's a couple of examples recently with clients where I noticed this pattern showing up. I was talking to one client the other day who is struggling with some health issues. And this client was saying how she has had a variety of mysterious medical issues, no clear diagnosis, just random pain and fatigue. And obviously it's affecting her emotional well-being too. So we started working together and she's been doing a variety of different things. I asked her how her day was going, and she said, well, I woke up at 6 a.m., and I was feeling really happy, but my body hurt. And then in another case, I have a client who had been out of work for six or seven months, works in the film business, and she was being offered a film, but she was concerned about somebody who was on the project who was very difficult to work with. And another client was concerned about her financial well-being and then came into an unexpected chunk of money but immediately said, but I'm worried about these big expenses coming down the road. So in all three cases, the very thing that they were suffering from, so the first client was suffering from emotional well-being because of physical problems, didn't even realize that her emotional well-being was getting better, but because the physical pain was there, she immediately said, but. Or the client who hadn't been working in six or seven months was getting a job offer, but the first instinct was to say, but. And then the client who was worried about money, who came into a chunk of money, the first thing was to say, but. So if you've listened to these prior episodes, you've heard me talk about our reptilian brains, the oldest part of our brain being wired to look out for danger. And it's a survival instinct to avoid being chased or eaten by something in the wild. But in spite of modern civilization and most of us not living in the wilderness, worrying about being chased or something eating us, our brains are still wired for that survival mechanism. Consciously or unconsciously, we think that we should always be on high alert. So when something good happens to us, we're often waiting for the other shoe to drop, or we discount the celebration and we simply just gloss over the win the accolade, the joy. We want to immediately search 
for what's not going right or what's not perfect. And look, I am so guilty of this. Call it what you want, hypervigilance, obsessive compulsive, recovering perfectionist, trauma survivor. It doesn't matter what label you give it. It's just what a lot of us do. And even those of us who have a daily meditation practice, or those of us who talk about daily gratitude, or those of us who coach for a living, it's a habit and it's a bad habit. And it's one that I share with many of my listeners and many of my clients. I find myself and others saying, yes, that was nice, but. So we're completely negating the joy, the victory, or the gratitude. And this got me thinking about like the rules of improv comedy. Now, improv comedy, most people know, is where performers create a scene or story on the spot without a script or predetermined plan. And there are a few rules that guide improv comedy. The cardinal rule of improv comedy is yes and. And what that means is that the performer should accept whatever their fellow performers offer in a scene and build on it. In other words, everything is a potential gift. And this encourages collaboration and helps to create a cohesive story and keep the story going. So in terms of positive thinking, what does that have to do with improv, right? In terms of positive thinking, yes and can be related to the idea of accepting the present moment and building on it in a positive way. So in other words, instead of resisting what is happening or dwelling on the negative, we can choose to accept the situation and look for more opportunities to keep improving it. Okay, what's the second rule of improv? Don't block. This rule is related to yes and. In most simplistic terms, the one thing you're not allowed to say in improv is no. And I'm not saying you shouldn't say no in your life. I'm just saying you don't block good energy. That's what we're talking about. But yes and involves avoiding any statements or actions that would halt the flow of the scene. So again, in terms of positive thinking, blocking could be related to negative self-talk or limited beliefs that prevent us from making progress or taking risks. By avoiding blocking thoughts and beliefs, we open ourselves up to new possibilities and opportunities. So what's the third rule? Make statements. Well, this rule encourages performers to be active and contribute to the scene rather than waiting for others to take the lead. Making statements can involve making bold choices or taking risks, but it helps the scene move forward and engage the audience. So again, how does that relate to positive thinking? Well, making statements could be related to taking action towards our goals and aspirations rather than waiting for things to happen to us. Think of these as daily affirmations, like, I am beautiful, I am successful, I am capable, I am confident. Eventually, we start becoming what we say and what we think, but it starts with those, quote, statements or in this case, affirmations. Whether you say them out loud, whether you say them on paper, or just in your own head. So what's the fourth rule of improv? Stay present. This rule reminds the performers to stay focused on the scene at hand rather than getting distracted by external factors or their own thoughts. By staying present, performers can stay attuned to their fellow performance and the audience. In other words, remain engaged. Now, in terms of positive thinking, staying present can help us avoid getting caught up in worries or regrets about the past or anxieties about the future. Staying focused on the present moment, we're more mindful and appreciative of our experience. So overall, the rules of improv comedy can be seen as a way to cultivate positive thinking by encouraging acceptance, collaboration, creativity, and presence. And adopting these principles in our daily lives can make us more resilient and adaptable, and open to new possibilities. Now, obviously, I didn't invent this theory. Amy Poehler wrote a whole book called Yes, Please, which references the improv rule of yes, and. And in her book, she says yes, and is a philosophy, a practice, and a reminder to always be open to new ideas, to accept and build on others' contributions, and to always add something of your own. And she explains how this rule can be applied not only in improv comedy, but also in real life situations and relationships. But look, this is not just a philosophy or a metaphor. 
There's actual science that supports this theory. Dr. Joe Dispenza is a well-known author and speaker on the topics of neuroscience, meditation, and human potential. And when he talks about the negative impact of being negative, he's referring to the idea that negative thoughts can be actually harmful on our mental and physical health, as well as our overall well-being. In his book, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, a title which I love, Dispenza talks about negative thinking being a bad habit. So he's referring to the idea that negative thought patterns can become ingrained in our minds and become automatic if we indulge them. So these thought patterns can be habitual and very difficult to break. And he believes that our thoughts and emotions create neural pathways in our brain and that the more we repeat a thought or an emotion, the stronger the neural pathway becomes. Now he argues that if we can break the habit of negative thinking by becoming aware of our thoughts and emotions, intentionally choosing to focus on positive thoughts and emotions instead, we can rewire the neural pathways and create new positive thought patterns, thus attracting more positive, successful things into our life. Now, I want to pause here because the flip side of having negative thought loops is often associated with toxic positivity. And I want to be really careful because toxic positivity is an excessive focus on positive thinking and attitude to the point of denying or dismissing negative emotions and experiences. Now, toxic positivity can actually be harmful because it can make people feel guilty or ashamed for experiencing negative emotions, which can lead to a suppression of emotions and avoidance of dealing with underlying issues. We are not looking for a massive pendulum swing here. In essence, changing negative thought patterns involves acknowledging and addressing negative thoughts and beliefs in a constructive way. Toxic positivity involves avoiding all or denying all negative thoughts and emotions. And that's not what we're talking about. So it's a subtle, but really important difference. The key takeaway being just simply start paying attention to your patterns of thought and speech and ask yourself this question. Are you always focusing on what isn't working instead of what is? And are you giving yourself credit for what you've done right today or what went right today? And that can mean like little small wins, like finding a good parking spot or money in the meter or making your bed or remembering to exercise and drink plenty of water. You get to take credit for that. You get to relish taking care of yourself as a win or having something joyful happen unexpectedly as a win. So it's not always about promotions and raises and marriage proposals and, you know, buying a house. It's the daily wins. It's, I woke up today and my back wasn't stiff, or I woke up today and my dog was happy to see me. I mean, sitting in those moments is just as important as celebrating the big stuff. And then ask yourself, are you following the rules of improv? And I'll just recap those. The first one being, yes, and. The second one being, are you blocking opportunities by focusing on the negative? So in other words, are you saying no or but instead of I'm grateful or this is wonderful? The third one, are you using statements? Are you making statements? That is, are you using positive affirmations? Are you talking kindly to yourself? And look, if your goal is to be thin or your goal is to be rich or your goal is to be free, you don't have to already be there to make those statements. You can start saying it now. I am beautiful. I am rich, I am free. Because what will happen is you will train yourself to attract those things by simply saying them over and over and over again. And the fourth one is, are you staying present? Are you enjoying the moment? So here's the thing. Whether you're into comedy or neuroscience or both, there is evidence to support that your thoughts and your words have a significant impact on the quality of your life. So the next time something good happens, sit in it, enjoy it. Think of it as sunshine on your face or wind at your back. Let it propel you forward by appreciating it. And that will be the secret to attracting more of it. 
All right, friends, that's what I have for you today. I thank you for sharing this time with me, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Overthinker's Guide to Joy. If you're enjoying these episodes, please subscribe or follow this podcast so you can always be in the know when the next episode drops. If you would like to learn more about working with me as a coach, you can connect with me through my website at JackieDeGrenis.com. That's J-A-C-K-I-E. D-E-C-R-I-N-I-S dot com.